Good morning. This is John Dyes with Tripwire speaking. Welcome to our webcast on avoiding information overload, how to prioritize and respond to risk. So this morning, we'll be presenting, uh, Lamar, if you would go to the next slide, please. Our presenter will be Lamar Bailey. And we'll get that slide in just a moment. Our presenter today is Lamar Bailey. Lamar is the uh, director of security and research, uh, security research and development for Tripwire. And for the purposes of this webcast, more, even more importantly, he's the team leader for the vulnerability and exposure research team. This is a team that's comprised of, of our world-renowned engineers and the, the folks who do the research scouring the globe for the latest public and private vulnerabilities. From there, they then write the algorithms that are based off our operating systems, off the operating systems of the vulnerabilities, the applications, and provide the threat fingerprinting techniques to include these signatures for detecting these vulnerabilities in our commercial products, specifically IP360. The, um, this engine, the Tripwire Vulnerability Assessment Engine, is part of what we call IP360. This is our vulnerability management solution. And this vulnerability assessment engine is the brains for detecting the assets and evaluating the assets using the algorithms developed by the VERT team. This team is comprised of our world-class software developers and engineers with low-level understanding of network, uh, network programming, system and network programming. And Lamar is the leader of that group. So today we're going to ask Lamar to speak about this. And the reason we're presenting this, and I think this is an even more important factor, which is on our third slide, is to discuss why our tripwire vulnerability scoring is so granular. We'll also discuss how we arrive at those scores. And the reason we're having this discussion today is that most of us face the opposite challenge we once faced. At one time, getting information about things on our network, about our systems, about vulnerabilities was the challenge. Today, a lot of vulnerability assessment tools provide way more information than we need in order to manage that risk. So the goal of this is to use granular scoring, not just CBS, but the ability to clearly identify and articulate what those risks are, how important they are, where they fit in the context of our own business. And in doing so, we'll be able to more efficiently manage the risk by setting goals and objectives for ourselves in our vulnerability management programs. So you'll hear that we discuss this more in terms of management than tools, more, than, more in terms of management than assessment. And this scoring mechanism is one of the key factors in helping you make a determination on how to be more effective in assessing that risk. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lamar Bailey, who will be our presenter today. And at the end, I will take your questions. We'll close with a few comments. And we expect to run approximately 30 minutes from now. So thank you all for attending today. On, top, on behalf of Tripwire, we're glad to have you as our audience. And I will hand things over to Lamar Bailey. Lamar? Hi. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, and good you're afternoon welcome. or morning to everyone, uh, depending on which time zone you're in. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to uh, come and talk to us a little bit. So a quick uh, introduction on top of that of who I am. Um, John did a good job. Uh, I've got uh, close to 17 years experience in computer network security, everything from vulnerability assessment, uh, protocol analysis, all the way down. I've probably worked on just about every type of security product there is. Uh, I do lots of media interviews for Tripwire and previous companies. And we work with other vendors to solve security issues. Um, if you need to reach me for any reason, here's my email address, lbailey at tripwire.com, along with my Twitter handle, at btle310. So feel free to send me any information or comments about this presentation or anything. Um, I'm widely available. So let's get started. So let's start with what is VERT. John mentioned it a little bit. VERT is the research team here at Tripwire. Uh, VERT stands for Vulnerability Exposure Research Team. So it is a group of world-class developers, network engineers, electrical engineers, IT guys. Uh, we even have a college professor on staff. 
And these guys have relationships with um, other vendors, uh, other security teams, uh, various researchers, and white hat hackers. And we use these relationships to do vulnerability disclosure. Uh, not only do we write content for our products, but we also go through and find new vulnerabilities, release that vulnerability information to the other vendors, and work with them to get security fixes out to uh, all of our customers, along with their customers. Uh, you can find out a lot about VERT. Uh, we do blogs um, and a VERT Alert Live uh, presentation. So the blogs are on the Tripwire site. Feel free to go back and read those. There's lots of good information in there, no matter what level of security expert you are. So we have a, a motto here as the team stands by, and um, basically Tripwire delivers the most complete and accurate coverage for security issues that matter to real enterprise environments. And the last part's a big deal here, what matters to real enterprise environments. Um, and we'll get into that as we go through, so just remember that phrase. So let's start with this. Um, and generally you're not asking you know, for feedback on this, but what is this number? 58,000. It's not the, the uh, mega ball jackpot. This is actually the number of CVEs that have been reported, um, and I pulled this number a couple of days ago as the total number. So what does this number really mean to you, 58,000 security issues? And do you care? Here's a chart, um, and it's a little small because we went back to day one, and it shows you the total CVEs that have been released every year. So do you care about these? Um, and the chart's interesting. You can see the ramp up. Uh, we peaked out uh, there at, what year was that? That was uh, in the early 2000s. And then we, it's been kind of slowly going down. Actually, this year it's starting to trend back up again. They were getting more vulnerabilities that have been reported. And, you know, do you care about these? Well, the overall number, you really shouldn't care. If you look, a lot of these CVEs were reported years ago. If you're still running this hardware or software that's vulnerable, you've got bigger problems than just this. You need to really evaluate what you need to be running in your environment. So let's, let's take another number. Um, 320. So what's this number? It's a little bit more manageable, not 58,000. So this one, to try to put things in perspective, is the numbers that matter. 320 are the number of Shelby 427 Cobras that were ever uh, uh, manufactured. There we go. Um, but, you know, the whole number matters a little bit. If you have one of them, then definitely it matters. You have a rare car. But the numbers that really matter if you have one, you know, the horsepower, the foot-pounds of torque. Uh, the top speed, the zero to 60 speed. These are numbers that matter because these are the things that you have that you actually own if you own the car. So the overall number, those extra uh, 319 cars that you don't own, you really don't care. So we need to look at the numbers that do matter. How many assets are on your network? You know, what are the percentage of vulnerabilities for my assets that are covered with my current security products? How many hours does it take for me to patch my Tier 1 assets? And by Tier 1 assets, I mean the, the assets that are mission critical to you. You know, maybe those are your web servers where you're taking orders from. Um, maybe it's your PCI data, your credit card data that's stored. These are the things you should really be worried about. You know, each environment is different, so you have to figure out which of these numbers matter to you. And our goal is to make that a little bit easier for you. So. As VERT goes through, we have to pick which things do we cover. Like I said, there's 58,000 different vulnerabilities out there. We can't cover all of them. If we put every security company in the world together with all their resources, we probably still could not cover all of them. So each company has to pick and choose. So the way that VERT does this, we, we pick the coverage that matters. Um, we look first, is it an enterprise application? Is it something that we expect our customers or similar customers to be running? What's the popularity of the software that's vulnerable or hardware? How accessible is this? And that one may be a little strange uh, to some people, but for a vert, when we write coverage for a vulnerability, we make sure that we actually have the hardware or software in-house so we can do our research on. We do not base our research off of, you know, 
information that's posted on the Internet. We verify everything. That's, again, how we become the most accurate. So we have to buy these things. Uh, some things are very hard to buy and can take a long time. Some things, um, like SCADA equipment, is very hard for us to set up in a lab, and we, but we do have SCADA coverage. And the way that we do that is work with our customers to go out on site to their site with their SCADA equipment and write our coverage there. Um, what's the severity of the vulnerability? You know, is it a root compromise or is it just informational disclosure? Obviously, the the bigger the severity, the quicker we're going to get covered. And then what do our customers use? We uh, poll our customers periodically to say, hey, what are the areas you're most concerned about? What are the products you're most concerned about? And we always get some interesting things in there that maybe we didn't think anybody was using or we just didn't know people, you know, were concerned with. So we add those, again, into our mix here to determine what to cover. So let's take a look at our coverage. Um, this graph doesn't go back to, to day one, but uh, it goes back to Q4, Q1 2004 to give you a nice show. And you can see how our coverage has grown over the years. Uh, we do not have the lull that CVEs had in it because there's so many out there to cover. And these are things that matter to us and to our customers. Um, if you take a look, the blue section, which is at the very bottom, um, is the number of operating systems we cover. We cover 2,365 operating systems as of yesterday. Uh, most people probably couldn't name anywhere close to that many operating systems, but we cover that many, and those are firmware versions, those are you know service pack versions, all of that incorporates into this one number. Then the next line up here is the red line, applications. We scan and cover applications. There's 13,220 applications that we detect and write coverage for within IP360. Um, the orange section is configurations. Uh, that is the security configurations and compliance configurations that's covered in our CCM product. And then the last section, the green one, is the vulnerabilities. As of last week, there was 54,088 vulnerabilities that we covered uh, in our uh, product. That changed today as we released our new uh, update today. So that number has gone up. So you can see, you know, over time we're trending, we're covering more things, and we're trying to be smart about our coverage. We're covering what our customers want and what our customers use. So the next slide is, you know, let's talk CVEs. We can only compare basically CVEs. That's the only way to compare apples to apples with our other uh, competitors. And we like to pick on our other competitors. So. Here, this slide is slightly older than the number I pulled first, so this was a couple weeks prior, uh, 57,000 CVEs total. Um, our number, were over 15,000, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, that's the number of CVEs that we currently cover. That's a little bit higher now with our next, our latest releases. Uh, Rapid 7 was at 8,000, Cause was at 10,000. So you can see even just comparing CVEs, we have more than our competitors. But again, CVEs are everything. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's the 58,000 out there. And they cover things that you don't really care about. Uh, one of my favorites that's out there that's covered, um, and I believe it's still in the system it was last time I checked, was for Becky's FTP server. It was written by a kid in college um, for his project, and he published the, the code, and then somebody wrote uh, a, a exploit for it, reduced the vulnerability information, and some of our competitors cover that. I will you know, hazard a guess to say I don't think any of y'all are running Becky's FTP server on your site. If you are, there's even bigger problems. But we need to break it down and figure out what can we cover that our customers are really interested in. So here's just a quick breakdown of some of the things we cover. Um, Adobe Flash, uh, almost in every environment. There's 309 CVEs. We cover 294 of these. So that's a 95% coverage rate. Uh, Adobe PDF, again, 93% coverage rate. IE, 69% coverage rate. And where you see, you know, a lot of these where you don't have the very high coverage is because a lot of these CVEs are very old and uh, are things that aren't being run anymore, uh, you know, NT4 and things like that. Um, then we get into Linux, SUSE and Red Hat, uh, two of the most popular ones that we see our customers running. These are not the only ones we cover, but just two of the popular ones. And here you can see, you know, we do not cover every single vulnerability 
produced by those because it's for some packages that we don't care about and customers aren't running. We do cover the applications and packages separately under our applications groups, so, but these are just for the OS itself or the product itself, depending on which one we're talking about here. Uh, Windows itself, uh, you know, over 1,000 CVEs, we cover 81% of those. Again, we're not covering NT4 um, or Windows 3.1. Uh, OS X, uh, lots of Mac shops out there these days, 80% coverage there. And then the Oracle database, you know, 84% coverage there. And again, this is not everything we cover. This is just a subset of some of the things that customers have bubbled up as the most important things in their environment. So we cover all these vulnerabilities. How do we make it so that you can figure out what is the most important to you and what you should fix first? And that is one of the things that we're very proud of, which is our vulnerability scoring. It is a heuristic scoring algorithm, and that is the actual scoring algorithm there. If you uh, have a master's or a degree in math, you can probably figure out how to, how to do it. Uh, we have to use uh, spreadsheets and and computer programs to automate all this. So the scores uh, are not high, medium, critical, and low. Um, I hate those, you know, because the first time I run a, a, a scan for vulnerabilities and I come back with, okay, I have 4,000 criticals. Where do I start? Well, I have to figure out which assets are most important I didn't go through that process, but I still have, you know, 500 criticals I have to deal with. And if you're a separate security group and you're handing this information off to you know, an IT team or whatever to patch it, and you give them, you know, a thousand-page report here, I need you to go fix these. It's just information overload. So you've got to be able to, to take these and figure out what's the most important. That's where our scoring algorithms start. Um, the scores range from zero basically to infinity. Uh, we have some above 55,000 now. And it uses a couple factors in here. The three main factors that this uses is time, how long has the vulnerability been present. Um, we use the idea here that the longer that a vulnerability has been publicly announced, the more people know about it, the more chance there is an exploit for it. You know, what are the risk factors? Is this vulnerability just, like I said before, information disclosure, or does it actually give you root access to a system? Uh, then finally, there's skill involved in here as a main factor, and that tells us, okay, how hard is this to exploit? Could it be something that someone uh, is going to take, you know, 12 months to write after they reverse engineer Samba, or is it something that's in an exploit kit already? Does this exist in Metasploit? If it does, it's very easy for someone to actually exploit this. And all that data goes into this scoring algorithm, and it puts out our score for that vulnerability. And if you think about it, if you look here, you know, time's being one of the factors here. If you run a scan today, and then you run a scan again in a month, the score on that vulnerability is going to change. If they do not stay the same because of that time factor. So the longer it stays out there, the higher priority that's going to be for you to get fixed. Or if we find out that, hey, a vulnerability has been put into an exploit kit like Metasploit, then all of a sudden that skill level changes and your score will shoot up. And as we do release uh, our updates, as I mentioned before, we release our ASPL updates, which are our, our vulnerability updates, we release those every Wednesday. So as you get those in the README, it will tell you about scoring changes that have happened, uh, especially for the big jumps. So I talked about the scoring, and you know maybe you do agree with our scoring, maybe you don't. And it depends on the customer. Some agree with it, some don't. So, you know, I talked about the date when a vulnerability is discovered. Um, like I said, the longer it's been exists, the more likely it's to be exploited. So some people say, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. Okay, that's fine. You want to do it? You can adjust our scores. You can take that out of the score so that you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, the risk, you can change. Uh, you know, like I said, we determine whether it's remote or local. Uh, denial of service, user access, privilege escalation, things like that. These are all configurable. So you can adjust the, the modifiers that these use. Uh, one of the most interesting ones that we always hear about from customers is local versus remote. And a great um, example of that is uh, if there is a vulnerability in Microsoft Word and you need to get a specially crafted Word document 
to your victim and have them open it. Is that a remote vulnerability or a local vulnerability? And this is, you know, a, almost a religious war with some security expert. In my opinion, it's a local vulnerability. Someone gave you the file, but you had to open it, therefore it's local. Others claim no, someone had to give you the file, it's remote. So depending on which side of the fence you're on, you can change that. And then we also have the, um, the vulnerability class modifiers. So again, you got your local remote, and the things that you can change in here, if you want to say, hey, um, the office products are remote instead of the local that you have them defaulted to, you can change that. And some of the classes that we have for you to be able to adjust these changes are things like web browsers, Java, web technologies, PDF, office products, mail clients, media players. You can go through and adjust these class of vulnerabilities and uh, really tweak this score and this algorithm to be something that you believe in, something that you use in your environment. It makes sense for you. So then we have the question, okay, there's all these vulnerabilities out there. You know, how do you, how do we get these, the things that we want into the product? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, the first way is you can enter the request in the Tripwire website under the ideas section. There's an ideas section. Uh, you go in, you can enter in, hey, I want coverage for this product, this vulnerability, this application, whatever you want. And you can see what other customers have put in there. Uh, you have to be a Tripwire customer to actually get to this section. But once you get there, you can ask for some, and you can say, hey, maybe this other company asked for something that I think is important too. And you can actually vote these uh, requests up. So we go through, we triage these, uh, we look at them, we respond to them. Um, if we don't agree with you, we'll let you know why. If we do agree with you, we'll say, yep, that's a good idea. We're going to put it in the product. And we try to keep that updated so you know where that is in the process. Uh, and voting up other uh, customers' suggestions, just bubbles them to the top of the list. Uh, so we'll triage that based off how many people have voted for it, and then based off our own scoring algorithm and our own uh, process we use to put things in. The other thing that we allow you to do is to write your own custom checks. So if you have, and I don't think I've ever lately seen a, a company that didn't, if you have your own custom software in-house, Someone wrote an app to do something that, you know, maybe you consider mission critical or it's something that, you know, you want to check on, then you can write your own custom checks. And there's a place within IP360 to do this. Um, there's some drop-down menus. You can write some basic things. Or if you have someone in your environment that, you know, just knows Python, not even an expert, just pretty good, then they can write Python scripts in here to do the checks. And these will run if you need local access to the box to run the script then basically it will use our um, authentication mechanisms that are built into the product, so SSH or SMB, uh, you know, whatever, to log into the box, and then run your custom script. Um, not only do you have to, you know, can you only write vulnerability checks here, I mean, you can write checks to check DLL versions, registry keys, file versions, um, but you can also do, you know, a little more non-security related things. Um, you know, you can go through and check, say, hey, I want to know which machines have Google's DNS set, and you can write a check for that. So it's a very useful feature, not only for security purposes, but just for kind of auditing purposes here. So you can actually, you know, take the, the product and move it out a little bit farther. Um, and, you know, we encourage our customers to share these, this information on our forums. Let us know, you know, what, what checks you're writing. If you need help writing a check, we're all, we're all here to help you uh, to make sure that you get what you need out of the product. Then that's uh, the presentation for today. Let's see, 25 minutes. I came pretty close. So now we have time for some questions. Um, and John, do you have any uh, questions from the audience? Let's see. We do have a couple of questions, so please feel free to uh, type in your questions. <coughs> um, the first one I have here is, can I see how the scores are derived on a per vulnerability basis? Um, I'm guessing that means can I, you know, can I see the, you know, how Tripwire arrived at that score for a particular vulnerability? 
Yeah, I believe that is in the product for each one that we list the modifiers on there um, so that you can see which ones we use to actually go through and, you know, you could go through and kick it in the algorithm, um, but we, we lay them out and then we lay the, the basic modifiers out that we use to get there. So you can see, hey, this has a high, the time is long here, it has a low value as far as someone will be able to exploit it, so that information is there for you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Is Tripwire buying vulnerability info from black hat hackers? <laughs> this is one I get a lot. I should have answered this one in the call. I've been doing this for years. I knew better. Um, we do not buy from black hat hackers. Um, and that is a stance that we've taken and, and I've taken over the years. I don't feel like funding the black market for these things. Um, once you, you know, if you're talking about a black hat hacker, um, they're not just going to sell it to you. They're going to sell it to everybody that has a checkbook. So, you know, you think a lot of times they say, oh, I'll just give this to you, and you get it. We do find a lot of the vulnerabilities that these black hat hackers are using um, as they start exploiting them. Um, like I said, we have a lot of relationships with many teams around the world, um, and we share information. Uh, we share information with vendors. So as soon as something comes up, we see it. So we don't see the need to actually fund the black market here. We would rather invest, we would rather invest that money in sharing up our resources and helping out the, the good guys. Thank you. Um, next question I have is, won't I have some really high scores? Absolutely. Um, usually on your first scan, you'll see something pop up and you say, holy cow. There, this particular host has a score of, you know, 80,000. And then you look on there and say, oh, well, here's this one check that's maybe, this one vulnerability that's 40,000. Well, the good thing is you say, oh, with our scoring algorithm, you can say, this one vulnerability is 40,000. If I fix that, I've made a huge difference in the security posture of, of this particular host, so therefore I've lowered the exploitability quite a bit. So... The good thing is, yes, you'll have some high scores, but hey, the good thing is you know where to go focus your attention. You know which things to fix quickly to make a big impact. And we think that's what really drives customers to get a lot of usefulness out of the product. And, and if I could add, it, it also helps customers start to establish a threshold, right? What, is it, what are our goals and how are we working towards those goals? So not only elimination of large, uh, high-valued vulnerabilities, but also reducing the overall score. So, yeah, great question, actually. Um, so we do have one more question. So, how do large organizations prevent the tripwire model from becoming too much information? Um, so yeah, that's a tough one. Um, we do give you a lot of information, as John said earlier. That's one of the, the problems that we've kind of all got ourselves into these days with all the inputs we have now. We just have information being spewed at us left and right. And basically the way that we suggest companies do it, kind of as John talked about before, is do your scan, look and see what your, you know, where your vulnerabilities lie, what your scores are, and set your threshold. You know, don't go give your um, IT department the 10,000-page report and say fix your security vulnerabilities. Let's start and take a baby steps here. If you have, you know, several systems that are above 50,000. Say, okay, let's take a cut here. Everything above 50,000, we've got to fix. We get those fixed, all right, we made good progress. Now let's move our threshold down a little bit. All right, let's go through and fix those. And when you walk down, you're never going to fix everything unless you have a very small organization. Um, but you're going to fix things that are important to you. And, you know, maybe you have mitigations in place for some of these things. You know, if you have a mitigation of an IPS in place, for a low, you know, in the couple hundreds vulnerability score, then maybe that's a risk you want to accept. I'm not a fan of saying, hey, I've got a 50,000 score here, but I've got IPS in place. Uh, that's a little bit higher risk. If you want to accept that, that's fine. Um, I wouldn't suggest it. But use that scoring algorithm and those scores that you get back on, on your report to just keep moving your threshold down and getting more and more secure. And then as soon as anything pops up that's above your threshold, you immediately see it and you immediately take care of it. 
great answer. Well, thank you, Lamar. Uh, I don't see any other questions at the moment. I'll give, I'm going to wrap the uh, presentation up. If you do have some questions, please feel free to type them in, and we'll get to them before we close out the webcast today. We do try to keep these brief to 30 minutes because we appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. Recordings of the webcast will be made available on our website. I've also, on this screen here, you can see a couple of pieces of literature. One is a brief and one is a detailed white paper on the vulnerability scoring system and how we feel we can help you reduce the risk in a very efficient, timely manner without TMI, without too much information or that information overload that comes often with security solutions. So for more information, we have these on our website. Please feel free to reach out to your local rep if you know who they are. If you don't, you have both my, John Bai's email, as well as Lamar Bailey's email on this page. We would welcome the opportunity to get into deeper detail with you. Also, please keep in touch. We will be having some additional webcasts and we have recently recorded a webcast with Forrester on the Tripwire Vulnerability Management Solution. So with those notes, I don't see any more questions today. I thank you all for attending, and with that, we will end this webcast. I wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone.